Hi, this is Kelsey Vukowski for AP Cup Review. And in Unit 5, dealing with public policy, we'll be looking at economic policy making as well as foreign policy as well in Part 2. So let's first start off with monetary policy. As defined here, it is the government's control of the money supply. Whereas when we looked at fiscal policy, that has a lot more to do with taxation. So when we look at monetary policy, it's looking at how much money is in the market. And really the government can control how much little or how much is in circulation at any given time. But you have to keep in mind that with monetary policy, you have to be very careful. This is very important that if you have too much money in circulation, well, then the money is going to become less valuable, and hence this is going to lead to inflation. If you're familiar with what happened to Germany after World War I when it became the Weimar Republic, it was paying massive reparations for the war, and one way to try to pay it off was through printing more and more money, and this led to hyperinflation to the point where it cost 4.2 billion marks at one point for a piece of bread. Literally, the money was worth more playing with than actually spending. But the opposite can happen too when you have too much uh, or too little money rather in circulation. This can lead to the opposite effect of deflation. Again, neither one is really good. They typically say that inflation of 1 to 2 percent a year shows a relatively healthy economy. So as long as inflation is not out of control, it's typically, typically a very good thing. So really, who has the power to do this? It's really the Federal Reserve Board. They are a very powerful arm of the government that is going to be in control of monetary policy, namely the amount of money that's going to be in circulation. Now, the Federal Reserve Board operates independent of government control. They are known as collectively the Fed, which controls money supply by adjusting interest rates. So when interest rates are lower, this is going to allow for more money, allowing for more borrowing. Conversely, when you have higher rates, it's going to discourage borrowing because money is more expensive. So really, this is important because you're setting the federal funds rates and you're also buying and selling government bonds at the same time. Now, the Federal Reserve Board, as I'll call the Fed at this point, is made up of seven members appointed by the president and approved by the Senate. Again, that's where you have that Senate oversight for a 14 year non-renewable term, and they cannot be removed unless, of course, they are uh, found guilty of some type of crime, such as bribery, or they retire. Okay, so the chairperson of the Fed is going to be elected by the board and is going to serve for four years and can be reelected. The board does regulate lending practices of banks, which consists of 12 regional banks, which in turn supervise more than 5,000 member banks. So you can see that the Fed has a really big hand in monetary policy. Now, perhaps the biggest issue for a president seeking re-election or any presidential candidate is the economy. The economy is the most important thing. The famous phrase, it's the economy, stupid, meaning that's the most important issue that's going to affect voters. Voters tend to vote by, based on what, uh, which candidate is going to benefit the person, the voter, most economically. So economic conditions are really the best predictor of a voter's evaluation of the president. So typically, if you see high unemployment, you see high inflation, these are two big worries. And as a result, this is going to especially hurt an incumbent president seeking re-election. Now, really, it's important to note that Republicans tend to focus much more on inflation because things are going to be much more expensive, whereas Democrats are going to be stressing the importance of curbing unemployment. So those are sort of the two issues where the uh, two political parties fall. But of course, both are going to be concerned about it. But if you look at unemployment rates following the 2007-2008 recession, you'll notice that you have it relatively high. Um, typically in a healthy economy, you have about 4% unemployment, where that's people in transition, people looking for jobs. But after 2008, you actually had a national -wide, nationwide unemployment rate of around 8 9%. And in some states, much higher than others. Other states did okay, especially out here with when fracking became uh, really prominent. But nevertheless, the fiscal policy of presidents and parties, really conservatives and Republicans espouse what's known as supply-side economics. That's the idea that the policy there is that too much taxation and not enough money to purchase goods and services. That's why you see oftentimes Republicans and conservatives touting and wanting tax cuts, because they believe that reduced taxation and government regulation will then 
help people to work harder and thus create a greater supply of goods. And there's also the idea of trickle-down economics in which if you have more people, uh, especially at the top, receiving tax breaks, that that money is going to trickle down to the regular middle class, lower class worker. But again, that is more of a Republican conservative ideology there. Now, some think politicians manipulate the economy to win re-election, but really there are some problems with this. People give way too much credit to politicians or believe that they have too much power in which they can actually change the economy. It's very, very hard to change the economy because especially in the era of globalization, you have so many different forces that can be very difficult. While the government can make economic policy, it is rather slow. Capitalism, of course, worldwide is going to affect the economy. You have things such as oil. I mean, oil is just not unique to the United States, but oil is unique to the entire world economy, especially with OPEC in the Middle East. These are things that the United States can't necessarily change. And also keep in mind that the federal government spends a little under 20% of the gross domestic product. So that's important. Other things that are going to be factoring in, of course, protectionism. This is a form of economic policy of shielding an economy from import. So if you're going to be a protectionist type president, you're going to be advocating for tariffs on imported goods. There's also something known as the World Trade Organization, otherwise known as the WTO. And this is an organization that regulates international trade. There's been a big push for free trade. And then you've seen some conservative backlash saying that this has hurt the American workforce. Free trade, of course, is controversial. Jobs have been outsourced, especially where you've seen factories popping up in India, Bangladesh, China. Um, so again, at the end of the day, there's a lot of factors uh, to really take into account. Now, really shifting gears a little bit, going from monetary policy to foreign policy, up until the 20th century, the United States was relatively an isolationist country, trying to avoid those entanglement alliances as were the famous words of George uh, Washington, which were really not followed all that well. Uh, by World War II, you certainly had the containment of communism, and then after 9-11, this is also going to be impacting foreign policy. So this is really foreign policy, uh, generally speaking, over the American history. Now, certainly some of the major foreign policy goals include protecting national security, especially with the rise of ISIS, providing international leadership ensuring a balance of power, preventing aggressive nations, for example, North Korea, from overpowering weaker ones. Russia has certainly come on the radar of the United States, but at the same time, cooperation with other nations through the United Nations. Human rights has been a major uh, focus, as well as promoting democratic values in second and third world countries. And then also to a, a decent degree is fostering cooperation with foreign trade. Now, makers of foreign policy, uh, certainly diplomacy is the main objective to solving pr uh, problems. The president uh, really is, in many ways, the head diplomat. While you have Secretary of State uh, John Kerry being uh, a major role there, um, but the, really the president is the chief diplomat. If you think about it, the president signs treaties, makes executive agreements, appoints ambassadors. So that's a major, major role. Now, probably the president's biggest coordinator of this is the Secretary of State, uh, who really is the coordinator of all government uh, actions that will affect other nations. The Secretary of State is also in charge of the Foreign Service, which is including ambassadors and representatives in more than 160 countries today. Also makers of foreign policy, the CIA is very much instrumental with gathering, analyzing, transmitting information about other nations, typically with security. Uh, the head is, of course, appointed by the president and once again confirmed by the Senate. Uh, most operations, even though the CIA is seen as a clandestine type of organization, they are relatively public and routine. You also have the National Security Council, which is part of the executive office that helps the president with foreign, military, and economic policies affecting national security. And as we said in the executive branch subunit in Unit, uh, unit 4, uh, that in includes the VP, Secretary of Defense, and State. Now, the Department of Defense is headquartered in the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. Of course, that's going to include the Secretary of Defense, which is always a civilian, interestingly enough, and supervises the Army, Navy, and Air Force. The President, of course, is the Commander-in-Chief. And right below, you see a picture of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. These are five members, including the Chief of three military departments, the Marines, and then a chairperson. Again, all advising the President. 
Now, there has been something called the military-industrial complex, the idea that there's too much of a tight alliance between business and government. You've seen this following, really, World War II and ushering in the communistic era. Um, but the linkage between the military's drive to expand with the profit motives of private industry have certainly coined this term, and we saw this with the arms race in the 1950s. All right, so let's end with a review question. The best predictor of whether a president will become reelected is which of the following? Take a moment, pause your screen if you have to. All right, and if you said B, the domestic economy, you are correct.